Okay, this lecture picks up with discussing <clears throat> um, Texas legislatures, committees, and subcommittees. And in the legislature, when we're looking at committees and subcommittees, <clears throat> what we're talking about are the um, small organizations that are put together within the House, within the Senate, um, who have generally specific jobs or perspectives that they're supposed to consider um, while the legislature is in session or between sessions. And their job is to provide a place for organized um, and calendarized places for people to get together and deliberate on a particular topic at a particular time. Um, when we're looking at the legislature as a whole, and you're thinking about how it gets work done and what its job is, which is if you recall to, to represent the people, <clears throat> uh, to represent the people, then this is where the real de democratic interaction happens. This is where the real work in the legislature occurs. This is where we see the opportunity for constituents, voters, um, representatives, both House members and senators, interest groups, um, and, and their lobbyists to all come together and present their perspective on what's going on, what should go on, and what's going to be best for Texas on a particular issue. Um, so when you're looking at the types of the committees that are out there in the legislature, um, there are seven different types. We'll cover each of these. Um, types of committees. Note that these are not uh, unique necessarily to themselves. In other words, a standing committee may also meet the requirements to be a substantive committee uh, or a procedural committee. Um, and so a lot of these committees can be more than one type at one time. So we're going to talk about all seven of these types in general terms to make sure you understand um, if you're in a standing committee, what the general purpose is and where it's going. Okay, so standing committees are those committees that are created to stand, to exist for particular material for a particular period of time. Um, and that period of time is the length of a legislative session, which in Texas is a biennium, two years. So a standing committee is any committee created at the beginning of the biennium and its period for existence is that whole biennium. So, um, biennium starts in January of an odd number year, and will go through the December of the following even number year. And that's a biennium. A com standing committee is a committee created to exist during that whole time frame. We have standing committees because we know we're going to need them over and over and over again. Um, we generally create them um, as a matter of practice or a course because we've had them in the past multiple, multiple times. We know we'll need them in the future. <clears throat> so when we start a biennium, we create the, the committees we believe we will need to work that whole biennium. And so you see the same standing committees being recreated every biennium. And that's all it means to be a standing committee. Um, is that it's a committee created for a period of time that lasts the whole legislative biennium. That's it. 
A substantive committee is a committee who is drawn up to consider a particular substantive idea um, or set of ideas that are, that are connected. Um, so generally what we're talking about here is a committee whose substance is a primary topic of legislation, legislation say education or spending appropriations or um, immigration border security or election security or um, um, law enforcement, environmental protection, right? These are all large um, substantive areas that you know when you start a legislative session, you're going to have legislation that's going to deal with this issue. It's going to either deal with this issue and bringing up new ideas, new legislation. It's going to deal with this issue and bringing up old legislation and wanting to finesse it, correct it, um, massage it a bit to be a more to be more effective, maybe a little more apropos. So we know every, every legislative session, we're gonna have legislation on say um, education. And so the house is gonna to wanna to have a substantive committee on education and the Senate is gonna to wanna to have a substantive committee on legislation, on um, education. Um, because they know they're going to have legislation bills brought up before the session that deal with that issue. And so this committee's job, its primary duty, is going to be to handle bills in the House or the Senate, wherever it's, it's situated, that are focused on education. And bills that are brought up with an educational focus will almost certainly be assigned to a substantive committee on education. Normally, the title of the committee gives you a pretty good clue as to what the substantive focus of the committee is. So if it's the House Committee on Education, it's probably going to say something like um, House Education Committee. And you can get a clue from that. Um, so notice this type of committee, a substantive committee, the typology here is focused on what it's going to deal with. Um, you know, the, in this case, what topic of, of legislation is like education. Quite often, almost always, um, a substantive committee will also be a standing committee. <clears throat> in other words, the Texas House knows it's going to have a lot of bills on education. It's going to need a substantive committee on education. It knows that they're going to have to do work on education bills during the legislative session and probably during the interim of that legislative session on education. So the House Education Committee may very well be, be a standing committee as well. In other words, it'll be a substantive committee on education that lasts for the duration of the legislative session. And in that case, that substantive committee will also be a standing committee. And that's how those nest together, how uh, um, we can have multiple typologies applied to the same committee. Procedural committee is a committee that's going to be handling procedural issues for the part of the legislature it works in, whether it's the House or the, the Senate. Um, so its job is going to be dealing with um, timing calendars, rules, um, 
anything that's right going to be needing to focus on how the work is done in a legislature. A procedural committee will be designed and put into place like the House Rules Committee, uh, uh, the Senate uh, Committee on uh, Intent and then uh, for calendaring or the, the House Calendar Committee. These committees are not going to deal with do we think this law is a good law or a bad law? Do we think we ought to change the wording on this law from may to shall or uh, will to, to may or something like that? This is going to be much more of a perspective of what kind of procedures need to be in place to handle the rules coming out of uh, this committee? When maybe do we want to schedule rules for uh, the House as a whole or the Senate as a whole. Um, what committee do we want to assign these to um, if there's going to be a, a second committee that maybe needs to take care of this? Do we need to maybe bring some members from the other uh, part of the legislature in? So this, this committee is going to be looking at procedural matters that deal with um, how the House or the Senate is doing their business. A lot of those procedural matters, almost all of them will impact this particular legislation or bills, um, probably bills that have uh, moved themselves out of a, successfully out of a substantive committee and are looking to take the next step in the legislative process. And a procedural committee will determine what rules or what procedures are in place that controls how those bills will move forward. You're going to need these types of committees every legislative session. Um, so it's not unusual. Um, and it's very much practical that these will uh, procedural committees will also be standing committees. So to summarize on a procedural committee, its focus is going to be on applying some kind of rule, maybe a time frame. Uh, maybe a direction or an instruction, usually to a particular bill, uh, delineating what that bill can do, how it's going to move forward in the legislative process. Um, these procedural committees are usually standing committees that last the length of a biennium and serve um, that whole time. Um, the next type of committee we see is referred to as generally a, a special committee, but you'll also see it quite often referred to as a select committee or an ad hoc committee. And regardless of which of these three names the House or the Senate gives to these committees when they create them, um, they all refer to the same thing. And that's the creation of a committee to deal with a specific issue. Um, and to generate a report about that issue that's going to come back uh, to the House or the Senate or the legislature as a whole. Uh, special committees, select committees are uh, basically a creation of a focus group of legislators to hone in on something and give time, effort, and research to a particular issue. Um, quite often, you will see the work of these special committees, um, their report, their result will then be um, a bill, um, you know, a proposed legislation to handle a particular issue. They will have been sent off to, to look at a problem, to gather information, to consider the scope of the issue, and to come back with some kind of proposed resolution. And that might look like a or might specifically be a new piece of legislation. When these committees are created, um, they are given the, their topic, their issue that they're going to focus on. It will usually also be in the title. And they are given a specific amount of time that that committee can ask to get that work done and report back. 
And um, if they don't report back in that amount of time, the committee dissolves around them and their authority to work on that issue and report on that issue um, will disappear. I'll give you an example of, of where we see this kind of thing. Um, several years ago, up in West Texas, the city west, north of Waco, um, we had a large explosion occur. And what happened was a lot of agricultural um, fertilizer type material um, exploded and it destroyed a portion of the town of West. Some people were killed, several people were injured. And uh, there was a select committee put together to investigate what happened, to figure out what we needed to know about that. And this is outside of how, you know, the, uh, the state police or the local police or uh, fire groups of the firemen or whatever of West were investigating what happened. This is a direct inquiry from the legislature and their job, their, their focus was figure out what's going on here. How big a problem is this? Texas is a huge agricultural state. How many more of these repositories of fertilizer do we have around the state? How big are they? Where are they in relation to population centers? Could this happen again? And what do we need to do, um, if anything, about this issue? And so um, there was a select committee created to look this issue over and report back to the legislature as a whole. Um, and so that's the type of um, issue that can pop up. And it's the way that the legislature will assign itself um, a particular piece of work to go out and do that. And so the report from something like this might come back and say, hey, um, the amount of fertilizer that exploded there is um, ubiquitous. We have that stored in thousands of places across the state of Texas. And given the right circumstances, the situation of West could happen all over the place. And so um, here's what we learned talking with the experts. And here's what we want to learn looking at that particular situation. And here are our recommendations on how we address this, fix this, correct this, move forward, and try to prevent this from happening again. Um, and that report then will be taken up by the legislature and used as, as appropriate information going forward uh, to try to ad address that issue. I hope that makes sense. Okay, interim committees. Um, this will make a lot of sense if we start talking about the biennium again. Right, the legislative biennium starts in January of an odd number year, goes through December of an even number year. It's two, two years long. The, the Texas legislative session that occurs with the biennium starts in January of that odd number year and goes for 140 days. And then that session, regular session, is over, comes to an end. Um, the, the governor may, um, on their authority, call a special session or two or three or four. Um, and however many of those they call, it doesn't matter. Once those special sessions have ended, there will usually be a period of time left, a year or more, where the legislature is not in session, but the biennium, right, is still is still there. So let's say that in a typical legislative session, you meet for 140 days, the regular session ends. Let's say the governor calls one special session, it lasts for 30 days, they get what work they want done then. So you're usually in probably July or August of the odd number year. You have a year and five months left in that um, biennium. Interim committees are committees that are created to work in that period when the legislature is not in session 
to work in that interim period between legislative sessions. In other words, in our scenario here, that one year and five months. Um, these committees are created because there's work that needs to keep going on. And the legislators have gone home and the legislature is not meeting. Um, but there's still work that needs to happen. There's still times when the legislators may be from the education committee need to get together um, to do some work, to study a particular issue. Um, and so at the end of a legislative session or during the legislative session, it'll create an, a House Interim Committee on Education, which will allow that committee to continue meeting while the legislature is not in session, to study particular issues, to decide what they want to recommend, to find solutions, um, and, and essentially allow the work of the legislature um, in some form or fashion to continue while they're not in session. It also provides these interim committees um, a structure of organization for the parts of the legislature to get back together on a moment's notice to handle emergency. So there are interim committees um, that are going to be continually recreated um, to exist or to stand during the interim that allow the legislature to be on call and to organize around a topic or an issue or a problem and do legislature type work um, while the legislature is not in session. Now, as what we're saying here is not that they're going to pass legislation, right? But they are going to be able to come together and take testimony and do research and deliberate amongst themselves and have folks come in and testify to them and put together a record and hear information. And, and Right, do work that they didn't have time to do during the session, or do work that's come up that needs to carry on between the sessions. Um, so this is a way of, of ensuring the structure of committee structure is in place to allow work to happen. So we're putting these interim committees together out there with um, a legal purpose, a legal focus. Um, to make sure that the business of the state of the state can continue, even though the legislature as a whole is not meeting during that time. Okay, our next type of committee is a joint committee. This is very, very easy to understand. The legislature is broken up into two constituent parts, the House and the Senate. We talked about that previously. There are going to be times when you need each chamber to come together and work together. The creation of a joint committee, that's their purpose, is to allow members of the House and the Senate to serve together on a, a committee with each other, work with each other, um, and ensure that um, they're not going different ways down the same road on a particular topic so that they can right, uh, touch base with each other. They can talk with each other. They can make sure that as two legislative bodies that they're working in the same direction. So the term joint committee applies to any committee created in the legislature that has members from each chamber on that committee. You see here parenthetically, I have LBB. LBB is a legislative budget board. The legislative budget board is created all the time, every, every session. Um, it is a standing committee. It is a substantive committee and it is a joint committee. Um, it is also an interim committee. So this committee, right, is created and is very powerful 
um, as its name wanted bill, to allow members of the House and the Senate to sit on the committee and to continually work over the state's budget. So the Legislative Budget Board is one of those um, super important committees that um, every legislature wants, wants to be on, probably legislator wants to be on. Um, and it's gonna fulfill a lot of different roles. Um, and it holds right, several different types of, of perspective here, right? So, but it is a joint committee. It has House members and Senate members on it. And every committee, it has House members and Senate members on it will be a joint committee. Now, a particular type of joint committee, meaning it has members from the House and the Senate on, is a conference committee. Um, and when we look at the legislation, legislative bill process here in just a moment, you'll see where this committee comes in. The purpose of a conference committee is to work um, over a, a piece of legislation, a bill, to ensure that the House and the Senate um, are talking about the same thing and are going to meet the constitutional requirements um, to pass the same bill in each uh, chamber of the legislature. So the conference committee's job is to ensure that whatever the House decides to put out as a piece of legislation, that the companion bill in the Senate, <clears throat> in the Senate, now wherever it decides to go, that eventually the House bill and the Senate bill will come back together, and this conference committee will be responsible for ironing the differences out and putting out one bill at the House and one bill, exactly the same as the one that's in the House, in the Senate is there and it carries all of the compromise and perspectives and desires and needs of the House and the Senate so that the House can pass the bill, the Senate can pass the bill. And when they do that, the bill they pass is exactly the same and can then be engrossed and sent to the governor as one bill for the governor to consider. So a conference committee is a specialized joint committee that has members of the House and members of the Senate working together to pass exactly the same bill and to hammer out the differences as they came out of the different committees and the different chambers from the House and the Senate. Okay, so we're going to talk about their, the job of the legislature, which is uh, one of its primary jobs, which is passing legislation. Um, I do have a uh, chart that we will pull up and look at uh, that will demonstrate how this works. Okay. So what we're looking at here is the complete legislative process for the state of Texas. Um, you'll notice at the top there are two columns, one is the House column, one is the Senate column. Generally speaking, what you see there is the same on each side. The steps that occur to pass legislation turn a bill into law that occur in the House generally right, occur the same in the Senate. Um, and, and for our purposes, you can say they're the same. This particular process that you're looking at shows a bill that starts in the House and then is sent to the Senate, may have to go through a um, process of, of a, a joint committee to bring it together and uh, clarify all the differences and reconcile them to one bill again. 
these were the steps that you need to know. Um, so let's look at these, right? Um, <clears throat> a bill is introduced to the House. When it's introduced to the House, you'll have the House page that stands up and reads the title, right? Um, says, this is House Bill so-and-so. It'll read a short preamble about what it is, um, tell you what the bill number is. It'll be given a number like HB1, HB12, HB2243, HB standing for House Bill. And then they'll read a little bit about it. And then they'll say, and, and it's usually just a sentence or two uh, dealing with topics, so and so. And then the Speaker of the House will, and, and, and their folks will have already assigned this bill to a particular substantive committee. Let's say it was a bill that deals with education. House Bill 2243, dealing with education in the state of Texas, assigned to the House um, Committee on Education. Done. Bill's been introduced. Um, and so now you have, right, its first, that, that was its first um, reading. It is now legally a bill entered into the legislative session. Um, and people can expect that at some point something may happen with this piece of legislation. Once it's been read in the first time and assigned to a committee, that bill goes to that committee. Um, and the committee does its work. The committee's going to say we'll hold a hearing on it, possibly. If they do, they're not required to, but if they do, hold a hearing on it. They will post a notice of when and where um, they're going to have their committee meetings, when and where they're going to have a public notice or hearing on that bill. And then um, they will keep publishing um, the actions they take on that bill. Coming out of the committee, it's going to either get a favorable report or an unfavorable report. A favorable report will say, hey, we saw this bill, we talked about this bill, we had public testimony on this bill, we liked it, we changed it a little bit, amended it. And so here's what's coming out of the committee that's the substitute for House Bill 2243. Still called House Bill 2243. Amended or changed as needed. If substituted, it may have a new name. Or Bill may have gone through the committee. The committee says, we don't like it. And we have attached an unfavorable report, meaning this bill shouldn't be given any more time or effort. Generally speaking, when that happens, that piece of legislation is dead. There is the possibility occasionally that the bill may be picked up um, by a minority report, a small group of legislators that want to breathe life back into it. And they can ask the House as a whole, please revive this bill, adopt it this way, and let's debate it at the House level. That usually does not happen. A bill gets an unfavorable report, or it doesn't get a report at all coming out of committee. It's done. And this is the general um, result of most legislation. It goes into committee and never comes out of committee. If it gets a favorable report, a bill will be printed and distributed amongst the House members. Um, and to the public, and we can see it and we can look at it. And it will be, that printed bill will go to the calendar committee, which is a procedural committee in the House, to assign that bill on the calendar, specific time and place to be heard in the House, to get its second reading. And so it will be brought to the House again as a whole. This will be the second time. It will be read. Um, it will be debated, and if a majority of people like what they're seeing, but maybe want to tweak it, the majority can amend that bill, um, and the majority can vote that bill 
to a third reading. Third reading, bill comes back up. House considers it for a third time, it's read. And here you need write a two thirds vote to amend and or pass this um, piece of legislation out of the house to engross it, which is a technical term to say, we've blessed it and we're ready for it to move on. Um, and at this point it is officially engrossed um, and is ready to be sent to the Senate. The same general steps will happen at the Senate level. Um, that gross bill will be received by the Senate. It will be read the first time and referred to a committee, a substantive committee on education, since that's our example, by the Lieutenant Governor. That substantive committee in the Senate will read the bill, work the bill, talk about the bill, have meetings about the bill, post notice, schedule a time for it, hearings on it and will come out with a favorable or an unfavorable report. Again, with substitutions or not, um, a favorable report will move it to a printing position in the Senate, a distribution uh, position, and then that will be uh, brought up for a consideration on the floor. If it got an unfavorable report, then you know a, a group of senators may have to try to save it. Usually, again, just like in the, in the House, they won't. Um, there are too many bills and not enough time to generally spend your, your limited amount of time on a bill that got an unfavorable report. <clears throat> a bill with a favorable report um, will be brought up um, in one of two ways to the Senate as a whole. If it's a and we'll talk about this in a calendaring committee and process in the future. But if it's an uncontroversial bill, the Senate will, will put it basically on a, a calendar and bring it forward um, to be considered. Now, it'll get right at second reading. Um, if, the, if the Senate as a whole votes to bring it up, and votes at a two-thirds level to do that, it'll get its second reading. Um, the majority vote will pass it, amend it, whatever's needed. And then it'll be brought up a third time in the Senate, just like the House. Um, and a majority vote will be, a super majority vote of two-thirds will be needed to pass it by the Senate. Now notice right there's that extra step there where the bill is brought up for consideration by two thirds vote. This is a gatekeeper function that the Senate has put into place. It doesn't exist on the House side. And if right, a bill is controversial, it will need that two thirds vote to be brought up. If it's not controversial, it will be sent to what's called the Senate Intent Committee. Um, and, and that committee will, will schedule it, uh, the Senate intent calendar. In other words, they know, as the Senate's small, remember, it's only 33 folks, 31 folks. And they know if, if two thirds or more are already supporting this, this bill. Um, and if, if there's no, no uh, consternation, there's no controversy, um, it can be sent to the intent calendar and scheduled that way. In other words, you've probably got 30 or 29 or something folks that are supporting this bill. If it's closer you know, to the two thirds number, then it's going to be voted up. Uh, and the way it's voted up, we'll talk about um, here in a second. Um, so anyway, if it comes out of the Senate, out of that third reading, um, now you've got to look at what did the House pass and what did the Senate pass? Are they the same things? Um, if they are, if the, the, the printing that comes out of there are exactly the same, they're usually not. But if they are, um, then the House and the Senate have agreed upon a piece of the legislation exactly. Then the Lieutenant Governor and the Speaker of the House 
can sign off on this in the presence of their chambers and send it to the governor. If, however, that bill's been changed, remember it came from the House first, so if the Senate has done any change and if they've amended this thing at all, um, then we need to pull a joint committee of House members and Senate members together to consider this. Um, and what happens first is the Senate right, will print their amended bill, version of the bill and send it to the House and say, hey, here's what we're done, we've done to it. Do y'all all, all agree? And if the whole House says, yeah, we agree, that's fine. Um, then you can move forward and re request, right, that uh, the committee, the conference committee come together, vote this through, and bless it. Um, and the report's filed. Speaker of the House, this Lieutenant Governor get together and do their business. If the House says no, says no, we're, we like our version better than your version, then the Joint Committee is brought together on this bill with members of the House, members of the Senate, to hammer out a compromise bill um, that they can both work together and agree on. And then a report can come out of that conference committee. Um, and if what the report is agreed upon by both the House and the Senate is the same, then they're good to go forward. If not, they'll keep working on it until either they give up and the bill dies, or they get one bill that the House and Senate agree on every word being exactly the same. And at that point, the bill's en enrolled, and the Speaker and the Lieutenant Governor in their chambers right, sign it and send it to the governor. Uh, once it gets to the governor, we'll talk about this more in depth when we talk about the governor. The governor has a few options. The governor can sign the bill into law. The governor can veto the bill. Um, or the governor can simply let the bill sit on his desk. If the governor lets the bill sit on her desk, um, and there's more than 10 days left in the legislative session, that bill will become law without the governor's signature. And she will say, you know, I understood that. I don't want my name on this piece of legislation. Um, if there's less than 10 days left in the legislative session, and the governor lets the bill sit on her desk, um, when the legislative session ends and there's no signature, that bill dies, does not become law. So essentially what we have is a, a window at the very end of the legislative session, the last 10 days, where the governor has an option to neither sign the bill nor veto the bill um, and, and either let it, become, let it become law or not. Again, if there are 10 days left, they don't sign it, it becomes law regardless. If there are less than 10 days, they don't sign it, it does not. Um, A governor might do this because they know there's political support behind the bill. And if they were to veto the bill outright, they could get overridden and that would be politically embarrassing. So they don't want to do that. So they just don't sign it in that last 10 days. Um, and it becomes law without their signature. Um, <clears throat> the reason this 10 day window exists is because there's a bit of uh, language in the Constitution that says the governor shall have 10 days to consider a piece of legislation. In other words, the legislature can't hold everything at the end and say, oh, we were real busy, but here's a thousand bills you need to, to look, work through in the last 24 hours. That doesn't work. Um, if you want a bill, if you want the governor to have to look at a bill, and to have to sign it or have to veto it, then you need to get that bill on their desk with 11 days or more. Otherwise, this 10-day window with its unique circumstances is going to apply to your piece of legislation. Um, the standard process is that most bills um, that are controversial are going to get there with more than 10 days 
and the governor's going to have to sign the bill or veto the bill. Um, if the governor signs the bill, um, generally the governor will give a list of reasons. I'm sorry, if the governor vetoes the bill, the governor will give a list of reasons that they vetoed that bill. And the legislature will have time um, to address those problems and override that veto with a two thirds vote on both the House and the Senate. So if the House and the Senate are in lockstep in agreement to a two thirds, to a tune of two thirds of each of their chambers, they can pass legislation over the veto of a governor. Um, if they don't have that much um, consolidation, then a veto of a governor can take a piece of legislation off the board and kill it. And so this is something that the legislators have to keep in mind as they're putting legislation together, uh, whether it will garner the support of the governor or not. That's usually not hard to figure out. Legislatures are have that piece of information in their hand when they push the bill up to the desk of a governor. Um, and so um, they know ahead of time whether the governor's probably going to veto it or not and whether or not they have the ability to override that veto or not. Um, and then the governor has to make the decision what they do with it. So again, the options of the governor when a bill lands on their desk is sign it into law, veto it, and see what the legislature does and whether they have the uh, um, two thirds majority to override that veto or not, and see whether the bill becomes law over their objection or not. Or if it's within that special 10 day time window, decide whether they sign it or whether they let it sit without a signature. And if it sits without a signature and there's less than 10 days left, they effectively kill the bill without giving the legislature an opportunity to overcome an official veto. There are three types of legislation that you see work itself through uh, the Texas legislature. There are um, four, I guess, some, some over, overlap here. Um, very easy definitions to go with each of these. Um, most of the time, the type of work that's moving itself through the legislature is a bill. And a bill is any proposed law, right? Anything that the legislature wants to put into and make law is called a bill. Um, it's not a bill, it's a resolution. And a resolution comes in a couple different flavors. Um, it can be a resolution from one part of the legislature. We call those simple resolutions. They come will be a House resolution or a Senate resolution. And it's a proposed proposition of an action uh, that only affects one chamber. It doesn't carry the force of law. Um, and most often it's a way of the House or the Senate putting a statement out in public. The House resolves X. The Senate resolves X. And, and whatever X is, is their resolution. Quite often you'll see this um, simple resolution put out as a, a recognition of um, effort or work on the part of an organization or a person in the state of Texas. Um, maybe a resolution that recognizes a particular day of the year as Jalapeno, Texas Jalapeno Day or something. That would be a resolution. Um, and it would, if it comes from just the House or just the Senate, it would be a simple resolution. Um, if it was right, um, coming from both the House and the Senate, and it's proposing national or Texas Jalapeno Day, then we'd call that a concurrent, meaning coming from both. Uh, we call that a concurrent resolution. 
And that's what you see most of the time is a bill, a simple resolution, or a concurrent resolution. However, there is a particular animal called a joint resolution. Now, joint resolution means here is a piece of work coming from the legislature, joint, House and Senate. And it has something to do with a constitution and changing a constitution. Um, a joint resolution might be a proposed amendment to the Texas Constitution. Um, in Texas, constitutional amendments, as we've talked about earlier, can come about in two ways, right? From the, the, the state as a whole or the people, or from the legislature. So a proposed amendment to the, legis from, to the Texas Constitution can come from the legislature as a whole. That proposed amendment to the Texas Constitution is technically called a joint resolution. If a joint resolution passes, it will then be placed on a ballot as a proposed constitutional amendment for ratification by the people of Texas. So, and that's the way we almost always amend the Constitution of Texas. State legislatures also, though, Provide a, provide a federal um, duty. And if the federal government is proposing through either of the ways that it proposes to amend the US Constitution, right, a, a proposal has been made through a convention of the states or through um, the legislature at the US level, Congress has done it. That US constitutional proposition uh, rat amendment will be sent to the states to be ratified. And one of the ways that it can be ratified in, by the state is in Texas is by the state legislature. So if amendment to the U.S. Constitution is sent to this Texas state legislature, it will take the form of a joint resolution and the House and the Senate will sit and vote on whether to ratify an amendment to the US Constitution. Well, we do not see this very often, um, where this, the, the legislature is sitting in on the ratification uh, process of the US amendment, because we don't usually have that many amendments from the US Constitution. We do see every legislative session four, eight, ten joint resolutions um, coming out of the legislature for propositions to amend the Texas Constitution. <clears throat> Constitution. So that's where you're going to see that most often. Right, most often a joint resolution is going to be the Texas legislature proposing an amendment to the Texas Constitution. So those are the four types of legislative processes that work their way um, through the legislative um, process. A bill, a joint resolution, a simple resolution, or a concurrent re resolution. Okay, the last two slides we're going to talk about is how the House, during the legislative process, manages its time for legislation and how the Senate does it, because they're a little different. And we've pointed this out as we went through the flow chart there of the legislative process. And in the House, the House has a committee called the House Calendars Committee. And their job is to set the daily calendar for the house. Here's what we're going to do today. Here are the things they're going to 
that the House will consider on the, the House floor today. Um, for a bill to make it out of committee and to be heard on the House floor, it must come to the House Calendars Committee and scheduled to be heard on that floor. Now, despite all the work that may have occurred on a bill in its committee, its substantive committee, despite that it may have come with a favorable report out of that substantive committee in the House, the House Calendar Committee makes a decision whether a bill gets time to be scheduled for a hearing on the floor or not. So this committee, in a very large sense, serves to act as a gatekeeper of what's coming out of right, the committees that are doing all the substantive work and what makes it to the House. The people that serve on the House Calendar Committee have been appointed by the House Speaker of the House, and they are loyal to the Speaker of the House. And so if a bill comes out of a committee, comes to the Calendar Committee, the Calendar Committee is going to be asking themselves, is this a bill that the Speaker wants on the floor or not? Has the Speaker told us something about this bill? Do they? Does, does she want it to be brought forward or not? If the answer is yes, they'll carve out time for that bill and they'll put it on the calendar. If it's not, Speaker of the House, she said she doesn't want to see it, then they won't. And that bill will sit in the House Calendar Committee and die. Um, and so this is one of those places where you see the strength of the majority party and the, ma the majority leadership, Speaker of the House, exercise their power on what will or will not have a chance to become a law. In the Senate, they do it a little different. They don't have a Senate calendar committee. Um, for, and, and, and the reason they don't have one is because they've got a very small number of people looking at this and they have an idea uh, as a group what they want to hear and what they don't want to hear. And Lieutenant Governor is a part and parcel of all of that as a, the leadership in the Senate and has a direct voice to the people in the committees. They don't need a gatekeeper committee to decide whether something's going to get on that or not. They do things a little different. However, there is a committee, the Senate Administration Committee, that handles procedural um, issues for the Senate. And if a non-controversial bill, a bill is coming forward that needs to be passed, everybody who's on board with it, it just needs to go through the steps, that non-controversial bill will get scheduled for a hearing on the Senate floor by the Senate Administration Committee. Bills, though, that have been come out of committee and have had some sort of debate and effort and work and need some, some uh, deliberation are going to be sent to something that's called the intent calendar. Now, the intent calendar is the list of bills waiting to be heard on the Senate floor. And they're just lined up on that intent calendar. In other words, um, I'm a sponsor of this bill and I have the intent to bring it forward for debate in the whole Senate. Um, but with a group of 30 some odd folks, you don't have to um, sit there and work it through committee. You just put it out there and um, wait for it to be heard. The interesting thing is the Senate has a process that ensures that every bill, and you saw this on the flow chart, that's going to be debated on the Senate floor has been approved for debate by two thirds of the Senate. Um, and the way this happens is they use the rules of procedure uh, for handling the Senate's business as a way of managing what bill gets debated or not. 
beginning of the legislative session. The Senate puts Senate Bill, I'll say one, on the floor for active debate. And the rules of the Senate are, if there's a bill in debate on the floor, no other business can come before the Senate as a whole without voting to bring the bill that's up for discussion down and set it aside for a period of time. So the Senate, as a matter of tradition, places a bottleneck bill, Senate Bill 1, we'll call it, um, on the floor for senatorial debate. And then they promptly go off and do other work. And that bill's never debated. But technically, it's on the floor. So technically, the Senate cannot meet as a whole and discuss other business as a whole until they vote that bill right down, set it aside, and vote another bill up. And this has to happen for every bill on the intent calendar. So your bill comes out of committee, people like it, they want to have it, but it needs debate, it needs deliberation, it needs the whole Senate, right, to turn it into law. Um, you need to convince two thirds of the senators to bring down the bottleneck bill and to vote your bill up for discussion. Now remember, this is just for the second reading this has to happen. So for this to pass, for second reading to a third reading, it only needs a majority vote, but it has to have a two thirds vote to get status to be debated on the floor. And this is how the Senate manages their business. If you can't convince two thirds of the senators that the bill's important, <clears throat> excuse me, important enough to be debated, then they're not going to lower that bottleneck bill and they're not going to let you have time on the floor and your bill will die on the intent calendar and will never make it to a second reading. So this is how the Senate right, manages their process. And this step right here, bill brought up for consideration on the floor by two thirds vote to suspend the rules. That's what we're talking about occurring here with the intent calendar and the bottleneck bill. Okay, that's where I'm going to stop on this lecture.